What don't we know about these guys? Well, the reason we don't know very much about many Arctic species is the Arctic is a really difficult place to work. It's dark, it's cold, it's hard to get to, um, and these animals spend most of their time, they are ice-adapted whales, they are Arctic whales, so they can be very difficult to find. Science in the Arctic is a slow process. I would say that, you know, to learn one new thing, it takes sometimes many, many years and failed field seasons and lots of bad weather and no whales before you, you get one new piece of information. So it's takes patience. 30-day field trip, you'd be lucky to get five good days. Yeah. So yeah. you could be waiting in a tent in the pouring rain, you know, for 25 days. I want to take a look at the, at the Norwal. Um, they call it the unicorn of the sea. Why? What is it? Tell us why, is this, why it looks like it does. Well, the, so there are, two, there are two teeth in the, in the upper uh, jaw of the narwhal, and they're embedded. And in the male, when the male, um, as the male grows, the left one erupts and turns into the spiral tusk. Darwin wrote a lot about the tusk. The tusk is a, a male trait, which is essentially used for um, establishing dominance and competing for females and sort of deciding who's, you know, who's going to get the, the female on the block. I want to get some photos, some pictures, some film you shot of narwhals underwater. Do we have that? You took these. Yeah. How far away were you from them? Well, you, to get any shot underwater, you need to be right up. You're right there. You're very close. So you're right there. And uh, yeah, and I've had narwhal face right at me and echolocate right at my body, and I could feel their echolocation just vibrating right off my body. And they're checking me out. When they're doing that, they check out what you are and what you look like and your shape and your, you know, maybe even what's inside. They have a sort of a 3D vision of objects. And that was very cool. Wow, yeah. and what did that feel like? What did that feel like when you Well, were... I was afraid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. They didn't start tusking or anything. Yeah, like that, right? I didn't know if it was going to skewer me or not. And the bowhead, let's talk a little bit about bowhead. For myself, one of the things that, that we don't know very well about the bowhead uh, is bowhead, bowhead whales produce songs very similar to, but much more interesting, than humpback whale songs, mm -hmm. which many people <laughs> might be familiar with. And it's not really clear why they sing and who sings. And instead of everybody singing the same song, they sing many, many different songs within a year and between years. So personally, for me, that's one of the big mysteries of the bowhead. And you know, the second mystery is how will they adapt to a changing Arctic? And how long do they live? Well, the Inupiat say bowheads live two human lifetimes. And we think they live over 200 years. And, um, that's been confirmed by scientists in two ways. One is with these whales that are harvested in a, in a traditional hunt, you'll sometimes find either stone points or harpoon heads that date back to the 1800s. And you can date those very precisely. But also you can look at the chemical composition of the eye and look at the percentage of uh, it's the rasmization of the eye and detect how old the whale is that way. And some of the oldest whales have been documented as being anywhere from 160 to over 200 years old. What's the, what's the biggest mystique about the beluga? About the beluga? Well, belugas are called sometimes canaries of the sea because they're so vocal and they can produce lots of different sounds and they can actually move their head back and forth. And they have this thing at the front of their head. Uh, you maybe saw it in the photo of the beluga that you showed called the melon. And if you yeah. see a beluga in an aquarium, which many people probably have, and it's making sounds, you can actually see its melon move as it's producing whistles. These are not <laughs> willing participants, the whales, so, so, you know, but you, you're relying on them. You need them to study them. What happens? I mean, this has got to be a painstakingly slow process sometimes. You know, working with the local people has been a huge thing for my research because they, they're, they're eager, they want to help. They, they harvest these animals. You can collect all kinds of samples that are really useful for looking at health of the animals, condition of the animals, what they eat. So we can look inside their stomachs. I've been through many hundreds of narwhal stomachs, which I can't recommend doing, but there's a number of different ways, strictly from having your hands on an animal, that you can learn. You use satellite telemetry? How, explain what that does. Yeah, so, um, you know, one way to monitor the, the behavior of these animals is actually to track them remotely. So we can go out, we can use binoculars, and we can try to watch them or stand on a cliff, but, you know, they might swim by and you'll never see them again, or they may never swim by. So another way to do that is to um, catch animals and put transmitters on them. The way they work is they send transmissions when the animals come up to the surface to take a breath, and those transmissions are picked up by polar orbiting satellites. 
And so those satellites can basically triangulate the location of the animal in space, and then they can receive a whole bunch of information like how deep the animal dove, how long it stayed underwater, what depths it, it uses to feed. So you can infer all kinds of of behavior just from those instruments. They're, they're extraordinarily valuable in the Arctic. And, and these are very difficult questions to answer. I mean, there's so many layers to understand and, and you know, in, in some areas, in most areas, so few data that we, we don't have the answers yet.